perhaps, perhaps we should start really, I suppose, with uh, your harvest, I guess. I mean, because uh, I think last time I spoke to you was sort of, uh, I think you were just coming to the end of your harvest or you're kind of in the middle of your harvest. Yeah, so um, last time we had finished our harvest and now we're going into our harvest. It's, it's already been a year, Richard. I don't know. <laughs> exactly. It does seem it's sort of groundhog day, isn't it, really? It just flies by. A very groundhog kind of situation. Yeah, so um, our new harvest would start at the end of January. So we're, you know, starting to prepare for for the um, yeah. 2021 harvest, yeah. yeah. So in a way, the, the COVID situation, you were able to obviously to get all your grapes picked, weren't you? And the the, the, the wineries worked yeah. okay. That, that, that aspect of it was was yes. reasonably yes. okay. So actually, at first we thought we were going to be closed down. Then they allowed wineries to be open because wine is food, as we all know, and necessary. Yeah. And um, fortunately, we'd had an earlier harvest. So normally it, at that moment in March, we would have still had half a ways to go. And we were about 80% done. So actually, the, the climate, which gave us a small vintage, which is normally not ideal, also yeah. gave us an early vintage, which was ideal. Yeah. And I guess if you're going to have a year with a smaller vintage, there's potentially yeah. the, a better year for that, isn't it really? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So what was the quality like? Look, looking back on it, what was well, the quality? Um, you know, the quality was very good. Uh, you know, usually smaller years, better quality, unless they're smaller because of hail, let's say, or, or yeah, you yeah. know, but, but we, it was mostly because we had a couple of cool winds. And so the Malbec is very susceptible to, uh, you know, changes in weather. That's probably why they didn't replant it in France, you know, after Phylloxera. And um, so we had lower yields. And generally when we have a lower yields vintage, as long as there aren't any, yeah, hail, any, any climactic accidents, uh, those tend to be better years. There's more concentration. Also the, the you know, the, the ripeness happens uh, in, a, in a more um, balanced way. You know, the acidity mm -hmm. is, is just right. There's not too much sugar. So yeah, it was a very, very good vintage. Yeah. So in terms of like looking back on how it's all shaped up over the last sort of, uh, sort of six months or so, I mean, your container being such a global brand, as well as obviously being <clears throat> very important in Argentina itself, but I mean, but you're quite well placed, I'd imagine, really, to sort of give us an assessment on how, <clears throat> how COVID has affected your sort of like international profile. I mean, what, yeah. what have you been sort of seeing around the world then in terms of supply? Well, um, first of all, you know, although we've survived and are doing uh, very well in our sales in many places and, you know, and our staff at the winery has been healthy. Uh, I still think it's a very terrifying year. So, you know, uh, and, and, I, and I do think that uh, because we are a fairly well-known brand internationally, you know, we just got the, the um, Drinks International number one most admired wine brand in the world. We talked about that last time. Uh, yeah. Our sales have been quite strong, and in fact, we've been very surprised by it. On the other hand, uh, you know, I, I am worried about what's happening to smaller producers. Uh, you know, and we're not a particularly large producer, but we've worked for many, many years at expanding our distribution. I was actually talking at somebody from Ridge, another winery, you know, in California, that uh, you know, Paul Draper traveled all over the world. My father and I have traveled all over the world, mm -hmm. so I think that right now these more recognized names um, are what the restaurants are choosing what the stores are choosing because customers don't have time to look around and spend hours at the wine store uh, on the other hand i think it's that diversity about wine the fact that you can have organic producers biodynamic producers sustainable producers uh, producers from a place you've never even heard of or a country you don't know anything yeah. about that's what's exciting about wine and um, so although our wines are selling quite well, especially in the off-premise, except for, for some cities like London, where the um, on-trade is actually uh, doing very well, um, I, I feel almost wrong talking about how our sales had been unexpectedly good, um, you know, in some places, although I wouldn't say that we're back to normal because we've lost the on trade in, in yeah. many countries and that was an important part of our business. So let's say that we are, we're flat 
you know, yeah. and, and we yeah. should be grateful for being flat, you know, yeah, yeah. although we're, we're much higher in, in retail. Um, I still, I'm, I'm just so worried, you know, I, I, I just feel so bad for, for so many situations. Um, you know, myself, I, I have, you know, my family who's healthy, you know, my husband's a doctor, so I'm, I'm actually stressed every time he goes to the hospital, I ask him, you know, how many patients with COVID did you see? And, yeah. um, I, um, you know, practice medicine for 25 years. I'm now in transition because I'm, I'm moving to a, a local clinic that takes care of the homeless, but they closed it because they didn't think they could take care of patients with COVID. And um, so- I, 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 I read, I heard that you are, aren't you planning on sort of stepping back a little bit from your, yes. your role as a, as a doctor or- Yeah, so, so actually the, the crazy thing is that I had decided in November, I had resigned uh, of my you know 12 year position. I, I've now done 30 years of doctoring. So <laughs> I, I've, Paid my dues, uh, yeah. and I love. I think a lot of people don't, don't realize they they they, they think <laughs> the container is this winemaker and the wine producer. That, you, know, just, you know, there's a whole other side to you. Yeah, I I love being a doctor. You know, it's it's this incredible responsibility um, because people trust you. You you have their lives in your hands, and uh, and you can make such a difference instantly for people. Not not like winemaking where, you know, you plant a vineyard and you don't know exactly how good it's going to be for 10 years. And then, yeah. you know, wine, it requires more patience. As a doctor, you can fix people's problems um, as an emergency doctor quickly. I think many other problems take years, um, just like wine and vines. Uh, yeah. but, um, but in November, I had decided to, um, you know, stop, being you know emergency physician where you know everything can come in from a heart attack to a person you know being resuscitated to trauma Amazing. um and uh and now i was transitioning to this local clinic which uh is here in san francisco and uh but they closed it so i i will go back to doctoring in some way uh because yeah. i enjoy it and it um it also has life. always yeah. what's that it's clearly part of your life. I mean, clearly part of who yeah. you are. Yeah. Yeah, and and I think it it's always grounded me in a way that um, you know I think when you're running a family business like a winery, and uh, you know I have a lot on my shoulders because you know my father basically changed the history of Argentine wine. Mm. There was no fine wine from Argentina exported until my father had this vision. You know to put. Uh, Argentine wine and collector sellers and the best restaurants, which we are now in all over the world. Yeah. And, you know, it's this very heavy weight. I feel like I, you know, like that, that Atlas, you know, with the, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and I feel like the whole country is on my, on my back because, you know, we need to continue to tell the world about Argentina, about our wines. And, uh, and actually in medicine, it's, it's more of a perspective about how short our life is on earth. Um, Mm -hmm. you know about how we are also vulnerable yeah you know that yeah. anything can happen to anybody at any point and and the fact that that we need to enjoy these moments that we have you know with our family all, all these simple things and and actually the hospital has always helped me do that um yeah and i guess this this year's been a strange year for for us all because we've we've all you know, obviously being forced to spend, not well, yes, forced to be with our families a lot more at home. And, and actually, I suppose there's been a sort of a bittersweet thing whereby, although clearly we're living in a very difficult time, we've also all had had these experiences of being able to share a lot more with our own families and, and actually get closer to our families that perhaps we wouldn't have done in normal circumstances if we were traveling and commuting yeah. and doing all the rest no, of it. Absolutely. And I, and I actually think that that's a place where wine has played an important role. Um, because, you know, what, what we're seeing is people uh, buying more fine wine, more expensive wine. Uh, they want to know where the wine comes from. They, they are actually reading back labels. Yeah. I, 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 I read a survey about people now reading more back labels because they want to know the stories behind each wine. And, um, you know, the Catena Appellations, which I, I know you're, you, you were shipped some wines, but I'm not sure they've, they've got... Yeah, they, have, they, have, they actually literally arrived five minutes before, oh before we put oh, that. Oh, great. I, I have some yeah, too, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so, so this is actually a label 
that um, is like the village wine from Argentina. And I was inspired by the village concept. I was in Burgundy. You know, you know that little trail where you bike yeah. and you see all the vineyards. And um, I kept on going from one town to the next and seeing, uh, okay, you know, the, this is the, the, the name of, of, of a town and this is the culture of this town. This is the kind of wines that come from here. And uh, I read a little bit about it and I said, well, we have the same thing in Mendoza because every little town has mm. the kind of Malbec that's well known from there. You know, Vista Flores is always the floral and the, the, the slightly light. You know, La Consulta is richer and with, with the, the really luxurious smooth tannins. You know, Agrelo is more the middle palate spicy. And all these same characteristics we had. And, you know, what I love about the village concept is that it's, it's a village. It's, it's the traditions of the people there. Everybody knows each other. And the same thing happens in Argentina. And I think it's one of the most beautiful things about wine country around the world, that people in wine country know each other because they tend to be multi-generational and to have been around for a while. And every, you know, everybody works uh, or, or knows somebody that works at a winery. And so the, the appellations are basically um, a brand that has wines from each appellation. And actually in Argentina, the appellations are called Indicaciones Geográficas. But I know that if it was called Catena Indicaciones Geográficas, <laughs> most people wouldn't know what that was. So we called it Catena Appellations. Mm -hmm. And we sell wines from these particular regions. And what was also important was for people to understand that each region for Malbec has a different flavor. Mm -hmm. And Malbec is, is really a variety that soaks up terroir. It is different in a different soil climate combination. And you know, remember in Argentina, within an hour drive, you go from you know, really warm weather, like the Southern Rhone up to Champagne. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. not only do you have different soils because of the alluvians and you know, bigger stones in, in the higher areas, more clays in the lower, but then you have a completely different climate. So you can have so many different flavors of Malbec. And what I found with COVID is that for some reason, this particular wine, this Catena Appellations, with, which has you know, 10 different uh, regions that are represented, has done really well. And also in restaurants, because yeah. um, I think you know, restaurants want to, to have something that's in limited production, small um, yeah. and distinctive. I think, what, I think what I find interesting about these is, um... Just say each of the labels, I don't know whether you can pick, pick up on the camera, is that you know, each, each one has the the map and the kind of the, yeah. the, 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 the show to show where, where these places are. But I, I suppose Argentina over the last sort of four or five years, I mean, there's been lots of winemakers, lots of producers have talked about the sense of place and the terroir. Yeah. Um, and I guess there's always a struggle, I suppose, for those who don't know Argentina, haven't been to Argentina or you know, it's quite hard to sort of visualize where where they are um, and actually i think you know just by using the appellation name it, it kind of like helps those wine enthusiasts who understand what appellation means is is it, it's like actually it's, it's quite a very it's a very yeah. canny way of actually doing what a lot of producers have been trying to do for a while and actually really put put that center place literally on the label so you know you got you got it you got it there you know so yeah yeah you know, it, it is interesting how sometimes when you're making wine, you get uh, complicated because mm. you know so much about the soil and how different it is. And you want to have a label that says, you know, a hundred things. And yeah. actually people don't have a lot of time no. and it should be simple. And uh, that's, that's why we called it Appellations. Um, and I don't expect people to remember, you know, La Consulta, Agrelo, Vista Flores, you know, Waltajari. Can you say yeah. Waltajari? But well, the but the Yeah, good, good. So I don't expect anybody to be able to say Gualtajari. Oh, um, yeah. But we can say it, but not in the, not in the way that you say it. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, but you can taste the wine and see that it's different from another Malbec that you had before. There's some information in the back label, and I do think that um, right now with with quarantine and people uh, with their lives all turned around. I think people are taking more time to think about the wine they're drinking. You know, we are seeing, I mean, you wrote about this, that people are drinking more fine wine, uh, at least when they couldn't go to restaurants, they were drinking more fine wine at home. Mm -hmm. And actually, 
a phenomenon that we've seen that's been interesting is um, that in the on trade, you know, where we've worked for 20 years to have our wines, you know, at really, you know, good places like, you know, the Ivy, Chez Bruce, you know, all, all these, these famous restaurants, um, they came to us saying, yes, we're going to keep on selling you know, these uh, 200, 300 uh, pound wines, but do you have something, you know, that, that the yeah. locals could drink? Because really the, the big business lunches and dinners had kind of stopped. And now the locals were going out. And, you know, if you and me were going out to lunch or dinner, you know, we, we might not want to spend uh, as much money as if it was a business event. So, so they actually asked us and, and, and we, uh, um, brought the Catera Appellations, which was a wine that we were selling a little bit, but not that much. And it really uh, did well because, you know, the, it retails it in, in a restaurant at 50 pounds, but it's, you know, it's a really great wine that comes from yeah. a small place. It has a, a little bit of oak. It has a lot of concentration. And uh, and it, they're all very limited productions because they only come from one place. And and I find that it's been almost like a reversal. You know, people used to drink really expensive wine at restaurants, and now you know, they're, they're wanting to be more casual at restaurants, but they're actually drinking very fine wine at home. Um, yeah, and I know you, you work quite closely you, with, with the vendor to try and try and make sure that, as you say, that those kind of restaurants are, are sort of pinpointing the right restaurants to work with for, the, for these kind of wines. So yeah. I think you do some work with Gaucho, aren't you, I think, with the, the Yeah, wine? so, well, I mean, I have been so amazed at the cleverness of the restaurants, you know, we are only down 10% in the last 12 months in restaurants. I mean, imagine that, you know, mm. they were closed for four months. Is that, is that in the world or is that in particular markets? In, in London, in London. In London, in London sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, in, in other parts of the world, we are, you know, down as much as everybody else, you know, 40%, yeah. 50%. It's amazing, 10% in London, that's crazy. Only, I mean, so, and, and I think that, uh, that that's because the restaurants have been very clever. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, they have made shorter lists, um, they're uh, selling through their wine, um, they, they're doing clever things like Facenda did an Instagram live cooking lesson where they were cooking with Malbec and they made Malbec bread. Don't you uh, want to taste Malbec <laughs> bread? Well, yes, why not? <laughs> <laughs> and, start, and, start, start the morning with Malbec. <laughs> yeah, exactly, Malbec bread for breakfast. And then... You know, there's places like the Ivy that have some outdoor seating, uh, you know, that I think that people think of Malbec and outdoors because of the gauchos and the barbecue um, mm. and, and all these things. And then at Gaucho, uh, we were actually selling a, a natural Malbec. We are still uh, La Marquijana, which I think you featured the label. And yeah, got, um, I was going to ask you about that. Actually. We might as well yeah. as you mentioned it. Um, yeah. You know, well, that's cool. well, let, let's finish with Appalachians and then we'll come back yeah, to this. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. Because with the, the Appalachians, is this something which um, you see working in, in other key markets around the world? Or do you, do you think it's specifically aimed at those markets that have quite a good wine wine knowledge and people are... Um, you you know, know, it's it's interesting because, you know, we have the Catena Malbec, which is, you know, like our Chanel number no. five, you know, it's <laughs> it's sold all over the world. You find it relatively easy. And, you know, I love the Catena Malbec because it's a blend from altitude. And the only country in the world where you can do an altitude blend like that with such different components of the same variety is Argentina. You know, yeah. it's our equivalent of the Bordeaux blend is, you know, Merlot, Cabernet Franc, Cabernet Sauvignon, different varieties give different texture and complexity. For us, we get this from very close together, different altitudes, and we get, you know, the more acidity, the more texture. So this is something that we can do that's unique to Argentina. And I think that that's why we have always focused more on blends. Then the Appalachians uh, idea had to do with really telling people about the, the complexity of our wine country. Yeah. And, you know, I think that is important for people. They don't want to think that there's only, you know, one kind of wine from yeah. Argentina. It, it would be like there only being one kind of cheese, you know, that, yeah. that would be really boring. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, so I think that, that the Appalachians concept which you know other producers from Argentina have also uh, made wines with this idea was was very very important um, but it started slowly mm -hmm. you know so in many countries um, we introduced it and you know uh, people were still preferring the Catena Clásico 
you know, because yeah. they said, I want my Catena, Malbec, the way I've always had it. And then I would say, in it, you know, in the last two to three years, it's really taken off the appellation. Because yeah. yeah. obviously, you, you're the other side of your business, perhaps people aren't also aware of, but they ought to be, is all the, the amazing work you do around climate change and all the research projects you have and the, the whole the whole division you have, don't you? All yeah. looking at research yeah. and terroir. So in a way, are, are these wines almost a sort of a, a kind of a cum accumulation, I suppose, of all, all that kind of work you've been doing, analysing what Argentina can do best and where it can do best yeah. and... Well, um, absolutely, because at the Gabina Institute, uh, we were uh, the reason why, for example, the Paraje Altamira Catena Appellations, one of our wines, why it, it came to be, because the, the appellation had been trademarked by somebody and nobody could use it in, in the local town. And so we actually uh, partner with the research institutions, institutions, with other producers to describe the alluvian why it was such a distinctive terroir in terms of climate, soil, and origin. And so that now we can use that name on the label. So a lot of the work begun at the Catena Institute has been to define th these appellations and how to farm in each one of them, because yeah. there's different water access, there's different sunlight intensity. And in terms of uh, sustainability and climate change, you know, I always think of science as having to be used to preserve. So before you can preserve something, you need to know what that is, why it is the way it is. So if I want to preserve the taste of a certain place, if the world wants to preserve the taste of certain you know, districts of Burgundy, certain parts of Bordeaux, mm -hmm. you need to first understand why does this wine taste this way in this particular place? So you need to understand the soil, the microbes, the, the climate, the ecosystem. And yeah. we've done a lot of that work. And, and yes, I think that ha that was part of the inspiration for this um, brand that has the name of each place. But in terms of sustainability, it's also very important because, you know, if people don't care where a wine comes from, from your region, mm -hmm. well, then nobody's going to bother to preserve, uh, yeah. you know, the little yeah. church in that town, the... Yeah. The vineyards, I mean, there, there's many very old vineyards in Argentina that, you know, people are tempted to replace them with houses. This is a problem for farming all over the world where, you know, people want to build. And if that place is well known, if Richard Siddle is uh, <laughs> drinking his, you know, Agrilo Catena Appellation, Mavec, and wrote an article about it, you know, maybe the people in Aguilero will think twice before selling their vineyard for housing. Seriously. Yeah. Well, perhaps perhaps other people other than me, but yes, I know. But I'll tell you. But the <laughs> but the the um. But obviously, you know, climate change is a real issue, isn't it? Obviously, not I mean, an issue everywhere. But I know in Argentina, you know, with with um the increasing temperatures and the and the, the the rainfall and um. So. Well, for us, actually, the temperature has not been as significant as the water issue. So, yeah. you know, in terms of temperature, we've seen some very, very slight increase, but uh, since we moved most of our viticulture to cooler climate about 20 years ago, when my father discovered these high altitude cool climate areas in the Uco Valley where vineyards hadn't been planted before, like in Gualtajari. Yeah. And, you know, this is a cool climate area that can probably withstand some warming. So. We have plenty of vineyards in Argentina at the right temperature and that they could afford having, you know, a drop in one whole degree, which probably won't happen for 50 years. Now, the issue for us is water. So the glaciers are, are melting and the rain patterns are changing. And so, you know, we have drip irrigation everywhere because if everybody's doing flood irrigation, there's not enough water. Mm. And, and that is the main problem, you know, recapturing water, um, how to use less water finding other sources of water. And that is definitely a climate change problem. Yeah, but also I suppose the more expertise you have in understanding that and then the ability to then make really quality wines in those areas, I suppose, as you say, it helps put more value back into yeah. what, what could be seen as an area that, that, that isn't going anywhere suddenly. So it yeah. took us through, because you, you got this, um, is it the Passaria uh, project, which is about... Passarisa, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, actually, but... it, this is how you remember it. 
Fa sa ri sa. So fa for Patagonia, right? Sa for Salta. Ri for Rioja, Argentina. Many people don't know we have a place called Rioja in Argentina. And then um, sa just to make it sound pretty. Or, or it could be San Juan. San Juan, which is a, a province uh, north of Mendoza. So these, this, this wine came about as the regions outside Mendoza, because Mendoza makes 70% of the wine, mm -hmm. but there's these regions that have long history, you know, dating back to the 16th century, just like Mendoza, where wine has been made, but much of that wine is sold in bulk um, through cooperatives, but mostly because nobody's bothered to study the terroir and the climate. So we have been now working for about 15 years in Patagonia, which is in the south, in Salta in the north, trying to figure out, you know, are there fine wine terroirs here? And what we have found is extraordinary. You know, mm -hmm. there, there are so many good places, high altitude valleys in La Rioja. In Salta, you get a lot of spice and a very particular kind of, you know, almost slight herbaceousness, but a good kind of herbaceousness. Patagonia is a little more generous. It has these winds, uh, so it's very easy there to farm organically. And um, there's a lot of old vines in Patagonia. People don't know this, but wine has been made in Patagonia for a long time. And so Pasarisa was basically a brand to highlight these regions because our idea was if we could do what we've done in Mendoza in these other regions, you know, what would that mean for the people there, for the economy there, for mm -hmm. winemaking there? You yeah. know, because if but your great, wine great is story about the whole thing it is about that, as you say, it's a whole Yeah, because circle. If you're making bulk wine uh, and there's a bad vintage, you just lost your shirt. You know, you're not going to be able to feed your family that year from your vineyard. Uh, mm -hmm. You're not going to be able to pay your workers. And so if you can make fine wine somewhere, yeah. really good wine, it changes everything for that region. And so we thought, you know, what if, what if we could do this outside of Mendoza and other regions? And this project is going really well. Um, mm. We are um, selling it all over the world, and you know it's it's gone slowly, which everything in wine goes slowly. You know, yeah. it's not like you you come out with Pasarisa and tomorrow everybody knows about these regions. Mm -hmm. I usually think of I don't know 15 years before yeah. a new concept, a new idea becomes recognized. And if you think of the farming side, it's more like 20 years. Yeah. So what, what, are you buying certain varieties? Oh, because I, mean, I think it is a Pinot that you're, you're developing yes. in, in, in yeah. Patagonia. In Patagonia, or? yes. Yeah. So, you know, what we did was focus on some varieties that were not Malbec, that were really interesting in those places. So, for example, in, in La Rioja, there's really good Bonarda, and uh, you can make these blends with Bonarda and Malbec that are incredible and a little bit of Syrah, mm -hmm. really, really good. Uh, then in, in Salta, the Cabernet Sauvignon is phenomenal. And in Patagonia, you've got Pinot Noir. You've also got some really good Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. and, um, and there's also good Malbec. So in all these regions, actually, there is a, a very different expression of Malbec. Yeah. So we are making Malbec. We're making these other varieties. In the north, you also have Torrontes. Mm -hmm. Are you, are you a, a Torrontes fan, Richard? Actually, from Salta, yes. I think actually yeah, that, that, from that's Salta. Kind of, yeah, that, that's a lot more. That, a lot more... Uh, I don't know the um, that kind of acidity in Christmas, which um, less less floral for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, for sure the torontés from Salta is is better than the torontés from any other province. Uh, no. So, um, so yeah, so we're doing both Malbec and other varieties, and yeah. you know, Malbec is is just a very interesting bird because it it just does well in many places and has a completely different flavor. Uh, but it's still a good wine, you know, it still yeah. has, you know, a nice mm. grip and, and not too much alcohol. Um, so, you know, I always struggle with that because people want to say, okay, Malbec from Mendoza, I'm done. Yeah. Bring yeah. me some other variety from Salta, bring me Torrontes. Yeah, but also think from the point of view that a lot of people who I know who aren't in the wine industry, who, who've traveled to Argentina, for, for a mate of mine, uh, Rory, who, um, who actually isn't very well at the minute, so uh, Rory, all the best to you, Chief, I hope you get better soon. But um, I remember he, him telling me, or oh, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, he, he went up to Salta and he, he just, just gave this amazing description of, of like traveling there and what it was like and just, 
yeah, I just had this vision in my head of like I wanted to go there, and um, you know, unfortunately, I was able to go on a wine trip, and it and it was everything that he said, and and um, yeah, so I think actually from people who 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 know Argentina as a country and want to travel there, places like Patagonia and and, and Salta, you know, it's, it's Buenos Aires, obviously, but then those are the parts of the Argentina that people are excited by, you know, just before they just by knowing about Argentina. And there's even uh, parts of Mendoza that most people don't know because, you know, if you go to Mendoza, you, you get driven around and you go to some of the fancy wineries. But if you go to the east of Mendoza, you know, it's very similar to Salta, but just there's more green and more flowers. But you've got this really uh, slow culture. You know, I call Salta the slow Argentina. And that's a compliment because, yeah. you know, you go to, I, I'll tell you a funny story of when I went to Salta. And I also love Salta is I was in, in a restaurant and uh, we sit there and we order some some uh, food and wine. And I mean, I think that 30 minutes passed mm -hmm. and nothing had happened. And we walked in and the guy was watching a, a soccer match. And, <laughs> and he hadn't done anything. And he said, oh, I'm sorry, you guys, give me Not 20 minutes. <laughs> 20 minutes when the soccer match finishes, I will bring you your food and wine. And we got our food and wine one hour later. And well, you know what? We were in Salta and we said, hey, we don't have anything else to do. I think he gave us a bottle of water. He said, here, have this for now. And you know what? We had the most fantastic time because we sat yeah. for an hour and we just looked at the sky and looked outside. Yeah, those are the stories you remember, aren't they? They're the great stories yeah. that you can share. And Yeah. yeah. And I mean, <laughs> the, the highest vintage, the highest vines in the world, aren't they, in Salta? And all, yeah, that's all the right. stories around yeah. people traveling yeah. and... Yeah, I mean, I know Phil, Phil Crozier at Gaucho was telling, well, when he was at Gaucho, telling me all about going up there and traveling around and... Um, yeah, it's just that kind of magical part of the part of the world, you know. Um, so that, we, we mentioned earlier about your your natural yeah. one. Then talk, talk, yes, talk, yes. Through, talk us through what you're doing yeah. doing for yeah. the natural <laughs> Well, you know, this is one of the great things about a family winery is that you don't have anybody from corporate telling you what you can or what you can't do. Yeah. So, uh, you know, my father and I, our winemaker, Alejandro, we're very curious. We travel a lot. Well, we used to travel a lot, but now, yeah. now I can travel by ordering wine online or going to a wine store or a restaurant. And, um, you know, I got really interested in natural wine. I met Alice Firing, uh, who is, you know, a really uh, well-known writer about natural wine. And I was really curious about you know, how wine would taste without sulfites. And I remember at first I started tasting natural wines and mm -hmm. I had the same reaction as most other people, which is you would have one really good one and one really bad one. It, it was yeah. really a 50-50 situation. Interesting, yeah. But then I started getting used to the ones that initially I thought were bad. You know, it's th that slightly oxidized flavor, once you get accustomed to it, you know, you actually grow accustomed to it and you like it. And so I, I really thought we need to try this and see if there's a variety in Argentina or a winemaking method that makes a really good wine through this, you know, low sulfite uh, method. Because, you know, you, you need to have enough tannins that if the wine oxidizes, it's not ruined. And so we actually bought some, um, some um, tinajas, you know, the, like mm -hmm. the, the clay pots. And then I also did some research and what i found out that was that basically for three centuries you know 16 17 18th century all wine in argentina had been made like this you know and it had been buried under the ground and then transported in these clay pots and actually my father when i told him about this project he said well i don't know what they why they call it natural wine because that's how my grandfather made wine mm -hmm. you know and and he said when my my great-grandfather came from italy you know, he used to always make some wine in barriques, which okay. was the way everybody else was making wine. And then the house wine he would make in the clay pots. Right. And that was the wine he had with his friends and the wine for every day. Okay. And so we started experimenting with varieties. And what we found was that Malbec did really well. And mm. uh, I think it has to do with the fact that there's a lot of tannins, there's good acidity. Um, it does great. And then Criolla, which is like our mission grape, you know, it's, it makes a pink wine because it's a pink grape. It's a mix between red and white grapes, makes a delicious wine. And Criolla, if you have Criolla not made in the natural way, like if you just 
add sulfites and make it traditional, it's, it's a very boring wine. It's not even a good rosé. Yeah. But when you make it without sulfites, all these other aromas and a little oxidation make it into a much more interesting wine. Mm -hmm. And I would say for Malbec, you know, if I have to pick my favorite, I would still prefer a traditional Malbec, you know, yeah. with a tiny little bit of oak. And, you mm -hmm. know, I, I, I think that the sulfites help, um, you know, bring out the fruit and, and some of the, the more particular characteristics. But the La Marquijana is basically a brand that has a label that my great grandfather used to use on his uh, barriques that he used to send by by train. Yeah. And so it's, it's actually an Italian woman and man. And, and it's very sort of 1940s, you know, okay. because it's, it's got that, that kind of drawing from that era in Italy. Yeah. And La Marquigiana means the woman from Le Marche, because, you know, that he was kind of honoring his wife, who was a woman from Le Marche. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's why we use that label. And it's the wine's been do, selling really well. And the Malbec, actually, I think it's fairly... It's a really good label. It, 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 it kind of stands out. No, it's good. <laughs> yeah, it's... I mean, we didn't do much. We, we basically used the same label as my, my great-grandfather had made it. But the Malbec, uh, I would say, is, is not distinguishable from a wine with sulfites. You can't tell that it doesn't have any sulfites at it. Yeah, and, and does it allow help with uh, lower alcohols as well, and just in terms of like that whole more approachable palate as well, or is um, that so, part of the reason? No, I, I, the alcohol is around 13. So, you know, we don't make very high alcohol wines because of the altitude and the cool climate. Okay. Uh, we yeah. ripen the grapes with good, you know, tannin ripeness and sugar ripeness at good uh, you know, moderate alcohols. No, it's not lower alcohol. But well, I do, I, I would like to make some really good low alcohol wine, but. Yeah, but all the appellations I've just noticed here, they're all, they're all 13 and a half percent. Yeah, yeah. Just, yeah, so good. Because I mean, after that whole, whole natural lower, low intervention, um, I mean, there's been quite a few winemakers, haven't there? They've been, particularly, I know in the UK, that there's been a lot of excitement around some of the lower intervention wines coming from Argentina. So, so there's, there's definitely a market for it in terms of a low intervention, but also yeah. from from a country Argentina where you perhaps normally associate with bigger, bigger, bigger reds, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, for me, the important thing with natural wine is to be aware that it brings out a different kind of flavor, and it does bring back something that was done hundreds of years ago. Which to me, anything that's bringing back something from the past, like Malbec. You know, yeah, yeah. we have that label that tells the history of Malbec. Anything that, that brings us back to the past to maybe a simpler life is, is attractive. But I think it's important to realize that the natural wines are not more healthy. Yeah. You know, and I think that that is something that people are confused in. You know, sulfites are used in dried fruits. So they're not used. They are there because yeah. all the, the fruits have sulfites in their skin. So if you eat a dried apricot, it will have more sulfites than a bottle of wine. Yeah. So I think that the idea that sulfites might be harmful, I mean, it is, some people might be allergic to them or might have a reaction, but that's very rare. Mm. And so I think that the decision to make natural wines has to do with honoring the past, um, a, a more simple way of life of making wine, of these slight oxidative aromatics and flavors that I think are very delicious. But I think yeah. it's important not to think of it as, you know, uh, oh, this wine is healthier than the other one. Yeah, yeah. So you, a lot of what we've been talking about here, obviously, it's, it's all about storytelling and it's all about the history of Argentina and how you're bringing that to life through the wines. I mean, which I suppose in, in the normal circumstances, you'd be traveling the world doing dinners and hosting masterclasses and, and telling these stories sort of like in person. So I mean, I, mean, I know, we're all in the same situation. We're doing this chat on Zoom again, but um, yes. <laughs> so well, what, what are you doing? I mean, I, I, have you been sort of living, oh living in God. places or, or how do you see things evolving in the next few months? Yeah, well, th the main thing is I've been saved by my dog. Uh, and, and I just read an article that English people walk their dogs more than anybody else in the world. Did you know that, Richard? <laughs> It still surprised me, actually. You know? <laughs> morning, morning, noon, and night. Yes. <laughs> yes. So, so thanks to my dog, I, I have little breaks uh, between Zoom and Teams calls. Um, but, you know, I have done uh, 
I think I'm over a hundred Zoom tastings since um, COVID started. I've also done over a hundred short videos to customers, you mm -hmm. know, who've asked for their website or they want to make a wine offer. And um, I've done a couple dozen Instagram lives, mm -hmm. but uh, I find that uh, I have to adapt to what my customer needs. So I, um, I've talked to so many people around the world and everybody's doing something different. You know, I had a restaurant in San Diego that we were going to do the play about Malbec. Remember, we, we have this play where we tell the history of Malbec and we had a professional actress. From, she was from London who performed this play and we took it on tour in Europe and in the United States and so much fun. And so this man uh, at this really nice restaurant in San Diego who also sells wine wanted to do the play, but then COVID happened. And so he said, Laura, I promised my customers the play <laughs> and will you please record yourself acting the play and then my customers will watch the yeah, video <laughs> while they drink your wine. So he sold, you know, cases of wine and yeah. I had to sit in my house putting, you know, crowns and <laughs> acting like a queen and <laughs> doing the most ridiculous, please don't tell my father I did this because he, he <laughs> He would probably, he would definitely not approve. We're not, we're not, we're not uh, recording it for, for us all to see. <laughs> actually, I think you could probably, if you want to see it, I, I could send you the link. It's on YouTube. <laughs> and, you know, honestly, I could have thought, oh, do I want to do this, uh, make myself ridiculous? And what I said is this um, customer knows his customers. He thinks they will like to see me putting a crown and, and acting mm -hmm. silly. And why not? Yeah. You know, why not have some fun? And, um, and so I've been very adaptable. You know, what, what people ask me to do, yeah, I, yeah. I try to do it. That's amazing. You've done more more live events than, uh, I don't know, <laughs> Springsteen or Elton John or I don't know who else. In the last <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I've done more events <laughs> through Zoom than I would have been able to do in person. Yeah. I mean, I mean, going, look, looking forward then, I mean, do you, you mentioned there you can't go back to Argentina because of the quarantine situation. I mean, where, are, you, are you literally just going to looking to adapt and move and see how things are? Or do you still have hope to be able to come to things like Provine and oh, no, no. I, kind of thing? Or? I think a, a lot of things are going to go back to the way they were before. You know, humans yeah. live to be with other humans. The, the, the greatest things in life are around friends and family. And okay. um, you know, there, there, there's only so much my daughter can talk to me about, you know, <laughs> there's only so many outfits I can look at. Uh, <laughs> she's 15, <laughs> you know, and, and when I have to actually talk to an adult, but um, you know, I think that the world will go back to something pretty similar to what it was before. Uh, I think there will be the pro wines and there will be wine tastings because, you know, nobody, wants to stay every night at home doing a zoom tasting but i think yeah. there will be more zoom meetings so um yeah. for example the one day to london kind of thing hopefully yeah. will not happen anymore because that is very unsustainable it the carbon footprint of flying you know for 14 hours and staying somewhere for two days is horrendous yeah and, and, and I, I, I think that's the kind of the the way there's an opportunity, I suppose, for everyone to sort of rethink about how they, they put on events and what works yeah. and what doesn't do and, you know, yeah. le learn from this experience, really, I suppose, and then adapt when we, come, when we can meet up again, perhaps do it in slightly yeah. different ways. I mean, you're not going to be able to replace that trip to Salta, you know, no, from not your no. No, uh, so, You know, that, no. that so, so I think that, um, I think that a lot of what we did before is going to come, come back but I think we're going to be more thoughtful. Yeah. 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 About, um, about our, our traveling, about what can be done online. For sure, wine tasting is very easily done remotely. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm talking to my winemakers every day. They ship me wines and we taste together. And it's not very different from being right there with them. Yeah. So just sort of finally, you mentioned that, um, you know, you're looking to sort of perhaps spend less, less time doing the, the medicine side, but more, more time 
um, <laughs> with the winery and I mean, what what ambitions do you still have in terms of like well not still have but do have for for um, what you want to do with container going forward and yeah. other projects? You know, Rija, just just to tell you, I was just I was reading an article uh, from you know the guy that wrote uh, Homo Deus, Yuval, uh, and Sapiens. His name is Yuval. Um, he's an Israeli anyhow he said that the future society you will switch jobs you know every 10 years because your job will become obsolete so just in terms of the medicine I I really feel like it's completely normal to have done medicine and wine for 30 years and now to be doing mostly wine because partly uh, my scientific work which is something that I find very important that we use science to make decisions because I, and I think particularly right now in the world, there is a lot of um, beliefs that are not based in science. I think science has made mistakes also, you know, science used the wrong way leads to horrible things. But I think that if we want to preserve things in the world, like vineyards, like the water and the glaciers, like species of animals, we need to understand their habitats and we need to use scientific thinking to -hmm. preserve them. If we need, if we want to solve the problems of the world, not just the medical problems, the the hunger problems, we need science. And so in a way, I feel like my medical training was a preparation for me to be able to use scientific thinking to preserve the region of Mendoza and the winemaking regions of Argentina, because they need preserving, you know, we have, problems with water. We also have problems with vineyard viruses, uh, with, you know, nematodes, with all kinds of pests. I I think people who drink wine don't realize that actually a vineyard is a fairly fragile ecosystem. Um, That's why, you know, farming uh, sustainably is so important. Mm -hmm. You know, understanding everything you need to do to, to preserve that vineyard. There's so many threats. And so I feel like in a way, the medicine which I have enjoyed so much was a preparation for doing this important work with vines and and farmers and the ecosystem. And I think that nature is just as worthy as humans of being yeah. safe. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, that's fascinating, the fact that you see that as a target as opposed to a lot of time I might talk to wine producers and they might say, you know, buy some more property or buy plant some more vines or, you know, uh, make, make a different style of wine. It's, you know, you're, you're looking at it very much from a, um, you know, as you say, it's it's from the looking at the soil and what else you can do for your region and the country, I suppose. And, and I think that for, for humanity, it's important because I think when people come to Mendoza, I mean, you told me that story about your friend going to Salta. Once you see one of these places, once you watch people live in the countryside making wine, it is a beautiful life. And you know, I think that there's a lot of talk right now about vineyard workers not being treated well. Mm-hmm. That's important too. You yeah. know, the <laughs> you know, you can't be selling wine in the in the best restaurants of London and your employees don't have enough to eat. You know, that that's something that we are extremely mindful of is, you know, how are the lives, the health of the people working in the vineyards and we actually provide housing. Uh, we um, help their children go to school and we, we, we sponsor scholarships for our employees' children. Uh, we have little buses that take them to school and we've actually had several people go from, you know, uh, living in the countryside in the middle of nowhere to being a head winemaker um, because we, you know, we, we really believe that it's, it's a whole culture behind wine that needs to be preserved, which includes the humans. But, yeah. uh, you know, if, if we don't have those vineyards to preserve, you know, we're losing a whole way of life for humans. And I think that that, that would be so tragic uh, yeah. if, if, if we lost the wine regions of the world. And I actually think that that's why a lot of people are so passionate about wine, because I think they see that wine holds this, you know, key to the past. And yeah. it is worth preserving because, you know, there's other things that are harder to preserve. So some of the food we eat has to be mass produced because otherwise millions of people will starve. So you can't preserve massal selections and have low yields and do all this careful farming that we do to make a really fine bottle of wine. You can't do that with wheat. 
because you actually need to produce a lot of wheat to feed a lot of people. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I do think that wine is, is, is sort of a luxury, but it's, it's a, it's a luxury that, that is reachable. Um, yeah, and, that, and, yeah. And I, but also get in a country like Argentina where you, where the, as you say, there's so many workers and so many growers and there's so many communities that rely on, rely on the, the, the yeah. wine industry being successful and having that long, that longevity. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Well, um, we could honestly, I could talk, talk to you for ages. I mean, I, I think the, the, it's, it's great to be. I'm looking. I look forward to uh, tasting these wines later. Yes. Tasting slow drinking, um, but um, and uh, you know, I think what what you've really sort of captured actually in, in with with these wines that we um, is that story that you just told about the the the, the whole history and the how the the cl climate and the soils and everything is all in, interwoven. So. Uh, once again, thanks a lot. Uh, yeah. we, 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 when we talk six months' time, hopefully we can actually see each other in real person next time. I know, I hope so. No, I, I am now actually desperate to travel. I've gone from the enjoyment of being home with the kids to now. Uh, yeah. I, I've told my team in Argentina that the minute the quarantine is lifted or there's more flights, I'm going. And, I, and my sister, you know, lives in London. So that's my, my second flight after Argentina is London. Right, okay. Well, yeah. thanks, thanks for your time okay. and uh, hopefully to, to see you soon. Yeah? Richard, okay, okay. thank you so much. Okay, bye-bye.